Okay, yeah. Uh, good afternoon, class. Can you guys hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. Can you guys uh, see the screen as well? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, someone emailed me a question about the labs. Is this person in class? I think his name is uh, Elvis. Nope. Uh, any questions about the lab? No? Did I send you guys? Did you have a chance to review it? Yes, sir, we, review, we reviewed it. Okay. All right. Uh, so uh, this weekend in preparation for next class, I want you guys to try and, you know, do this lab. And if we encounter any difficulties, then we can try troubleshooting it Monday. All right. And next week, I would also want to have two classes. I want to have a class Monday and a class Wednesday as well. So, yeah, prepare your schedules for that. Okay. So, continuing from last class, right, we started talking about binary numbers and then we touched a little bit on hexadecimal number system. Okay, now the hexadecimal number system, similar to the binary and the decimal number system, is just a number system which we use to represent values. In this case, it's hexadecimal, right? So hexa, six, decimal 10, right? So a bit backwards, but that's like 16 as the base for the number system. Same way binary is has a base of two and decimal has a base of 10, right? How we would go about writing these numbers. So in binary, we would have two numbers, right? Zero and one, right? Zero is the first number and one is the second number, right? Two numbers. Decimal, we got 10, right? Zero to nine, right? Zero being the first number and nine being the 10th number, right? Zero to nine. Now with hexadecimal, we got 16 numbers. Well, we know that the regular, you know, decimal number system we use, we only have symbols to represent 10 values, zero being nothing and nine being nine things, right? As in having a value nine. So we needed a way to represent values beyond nine. In the decimal number system, beyond nine, we just use 10, right? But you remember in these number systems, we want a single digit, right? A single binary digit, zero or one, a single decimal digit, zero to nine, right? Zero to nine. We want a single digit that can represent values beyond nine. So what we did is use the alphabet. And the alphabet was something that's fairly easy to adopt because we understand this logical progression already, right? We know that A comes before B and B comes before C and C comes before D and so on and so forth. So we said, hey, for digits greater than nine, let's just use the alphabet, okay? So for hexadecimal number systems, A represents the value 10, B represents 11, C 12, so on and so forth, F 15, right? And I'll say this again, right? The binary number system, we go zero to one, right? Only two digits, only two possible digits in each row or column, in each column, right? And decimal, we go zero to nine, only nine possible values in each row or column. In the next column, we put, you know, another digit there and combine the two digits to make a value that goes beyond the base of the system, right? Moving from there. So when you think about counting, right? In the hexadecimal number system, we go zero to nine. And then for 10, we would go A, B, 
C, so on and so forth, to F. And then for F, we would do the logical thing, right? We would flip back to zero. And then in the next column, we put a one, right? So after F comes one, zero, right? So binary, you go zero, one. Then after one, the last digit comes one, zero, right? Decimal, we go zero, one, two, three, four, five, up all the way up to nine. And then after nine comes one, zero, right? And then from this, we would count, right? One, 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 two. And you would also end up with things like one A and one F before we move on back to two, zero, right? So what you find is that this hexadecimal number system can actually hold a lot of values without using up a lot of digits, right? Because already one, zero at a 16 in a hexadecimal number system, this here is actually equal to the number 16, right? Which is much bigger than the decimal number system where one zero is equal to 10 or in the binary number system where one zero is equal to two, right? Now, the reason we use the hexadecimal system is not only because it's compact, and we can write large numbers fairly in a fairly compact way. It's easier to convert between hexadecimal and binary than it is between decimal and binary. So that decimal is fairly compact and it's a number system we're familiar with, but it's, it's very difficult to convert between decimal and binary. Let's look at this example. So we got this binary number, it's fairly long. Well, it turns out that in hexadecimal number systems, we can just replace every four bit, right? Every four bit with a hexadecimal digit and convert that number to binary, to um, hexadecimal very easily, right? From binary. How we do that is we look at the number 1110. And you say, hey, what's this number in hexadecimal? Well, 1110 is E, right? That's 14, right? You know, 15 is 1111. One less than that, it's 14, right? So this number is actually E, right? Fairly compact. We take four digits and we convert it into one digit E. This here is 000. Well, that's easy. We know that zero. So in hexadecimal, it would also be zero, right? This here, one, one, zero is six. You can use, use this chart as a little cheat. You can write that six and one, zero, zero, one. Well, we know that's nine, right? And again, you can use this chart as a cheat sheet, nine. So it actually turns out that when we do this, this nine, six, zero E is this same number in hexadecimal, right? Now going back, we know that decimal, we have to do a bunch of things, right? We have to divide numbers, multiply, you know, list out the weights and, and multiply by two to the power zero, two to the power one, all these fancy things just to convert the number into decimal. But hexadecimal, it's super easy, right? We just do this and that's it. And you can save so much space by just writing this number as opposed to writing a bunch of ones and zeros, you can just write these this compact digits here, right? And of course, when you want to convert back the other way, right? And like a number like nine zero e, you just say e. Well, e is one 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 zero, and then you can convert back, right? One 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 zero, and then zero 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 zero, and so on and so forth, right? Convert both ways very easy. Okay, now finding the value of a hexadecimal number, of course, fairly easy as well. We just use the same principle we've been using before, right? So for example, this number 1A2F. Right, at base 16, I mean, Okay, 
erase and all this stuff there. Okay. We know the first digit, F, is F times 16 to the zero. 16 to the zero is one. So that would be something like F times one. F is 15. So in terms of decimal values, that would be 15 times one. Two would be two times 16 to the power of one. So that's what we have here. A, right, would be 10 times 16 to the power of two, which is 256, right? So 10 times 256 there. And one is one times 16 to the power of three, which is a fairly large number, right? 4,096, which is this, okay? So in order to prove that you guys understand, I want you to just take a, take a few minutes, five minutes maybe, and convert this number here to me and tell me if you get any issues doing it, right? Tell me where is the work in? But I'll leave the answer right there. And I want you guys to go ahead and convert that number, right? Right, convert this number into decimal and you should get this number, right? Take five minutes. Let me know if you have any questions or you get stuck along the way.
How are you guys coming along? Anyone finished? Uh, yes, sir. Thank you. Anyone not getting the answer? Okay. Yeah. Uh, I think that should be enough time. Moving on. The octal number system. Okay. So the only difference here is it's kind of in between the decimal and the binary. So we go all the way up to seven instead of eight. The same reason, right? Zero, the first number, seven, the eighth number. And when we reach seven, right, we go back to zero and then one, so on and so forth. Following the same principle, all number systems follow. Right? Okay. Now, this one in modern digital electronics is not very useful. It used to be useful way back when they had 12 bit number systems, 12 bit, you know, computer digital systems, right? But since we've moved on to systems like the 32 bit and 64 bit, this one is no longer very useful, but it's still good to know. Like, the unique part here is that, again, every three bits, we can easily convert to an octal number. Simply, we come in, we know the number 110 is actually the number six. Number 001 is actually number one. 000 is actually number zero. This here is actually number three, this actually number one, this here is actually number one. There might be, you know, whatever, so on and so forth. And we know simply that this in octal is that just, you know, base eight, right? This binary digit is that in base eight, just by converting it in groups of three bits, right? Super easy. And of course you can go back the other way, right? You have an octal number. You can convert this to one on one zero, the one to zero zero one, right? When you're converting numbers like this, make sure, like for this one, you actually do put zero zero one and not just put one, right? Because you might end up in a situation where you convert the six to one one zero, then you convert the one to a single one, then you go ahead and convert the zero to a zero, and you convert this three to one one, and you end up with the wrong number, right? So make sure you remember that. It always needs to be in groups of threes. And even though the number might be one, you still need to put in these zeros, right? Okay, make sense? And to convert it, again, same way. I trust you guys can figure this out on your own, right? Okay, good. So that's the last of the numbers. So now we're gonna move on to codes. Codes help us to make binary operations a bit more simple and represent things that aren't numbers. So for example, let me start with the ASCII number system. The ASCII, right? We got these binary numbers coming in. Okay, we got these binary number system. Binary, one second. So as I was saying, codes help us represent things that we might not be able to represent using just binary numbers. Take for example, the ASCII code, right? So the ASCII code is a standard developed quite a few years now and the others that came along such as Unicode, et cetera, that you know, improved upon this and, and added other characters and stuff. But, 
codes like ASCII are a way to represent things that just aren't numbers, right? So for example, the decimal number nine, we can just nine, we can convert that to a binary number. We know that nine, the number nine is one zero zero one, right? But a letter like A or a letter like Z or maybe an exclamation mark might not convert to a binary number, right? There's no mathematical operation we can do on these things to turn them into binary numbers, right? So instead we just develop a code and I got this code here. This is an ASCII chart, right? You can see that every single one of the letters of the alphabet corresponds to an 8-bit, corresponds to an 8-bit binary number. So for example, A would be represented by this binary number in a system that uses the ASCII code. And a question mark would be represented by this binary number, the system that uses this code. Okay. So let me see if I can edit this picture. Okay. Another thing to note. With the ASCII number system, is that a bunch of these numbers are the same and they follow a logical progression, right? So, for example, all the capital letters we see have the same first four digits inside, right? All the capital letters. And all the common letters have this same four. Four digits inside. Yep. So, um, A, right? A, according to what I'm seeing, is zero one hundred. Mm -hmm. Zero zero one. It's the right. whole number, right? So, it yeah, yeah, be... yeah. No, attack um, the first four. Yeah. Okay. Right? And from P, it is zero one oh one. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, this one here actually uh flips over, so it's it's not for the entire thing. Yeah, sorry, my bad. Yeah, they probably just with this particular code, they probably just you know the same way we would go one zero zero, then we'd have a few numbers, and then we'd go over and need to run over to the next bit. So they probably just needed an extra bit to fit all the numbers. Anyway, as I was saying, different groups have similar bits within them, right? So we might end up in a, in a certain situation. Let's say we had four buttons. Let's say this here was a zero, this was a one, this was a zero, this was a one. Let's say we were just trying to develop a very simple code, right? A, B, C, D. D, right? What would happen is when we would press on the keyboard, it would take this zero and this zero and they would say they would output A. A, we can have that as zero, zero, right? When you press B, we'd have B as zero, one. D, we would have D as, as um, one, zero. And C would be one, one. Now, different codes vary in different ways. Right? But when we think about building a keyboard, we can think about it as having rows and columns with different characters in it. And when we press a button, it joins two different numbers together. Right? And it uses that to create the binary number that then sent into your computer system, right? 
that's just at on a high level how a keyboard would work, right? Another thing we probably want to pay attention to here, let me clear, is how caps lock white might work. So the, all the capital letters has, has this code, right? And as that student pointed out from P onward, it's, it changes slightly. But notice this fifth bit here is zero straight throughout. And for the common ones, right? This bit here is zero straight, is um, one straight throughout. Is one straight throughout. So if you wanted to do something like caps lock, right? And notice the rest of the code is, is the same, right? So this here is 0001, right? And this A here is 001, and this B here is 0010, right? 0011. And let's you know jump down again, right? Let's do P is 000. So P down here is 000. X is 1000. So X here is a thousand, right? We again see some similarity. So maybe what we can do is just, you know, again, we're trying to develop something like a keyboard, right? We say, hey, let's automatically store all the numbers in caps lock. And then in um, capital letters. And then when someone presses the caps lock button or the shift button, flip this bit from zero to one. So that way you can store all the information in one way and then have a button like shift or caps lock, flip this fifth bit from a zero to a one, right? And again, that's just a simple way, you know, how we can start thinking about how a keyboard would develop, right? Does that kind of make sense? How data might be stored in some sort of array? Of course, it's gonna be more elaborate than just four buttons. It's going to have, you know, long list of binary numbers, right? Multiple different buttons to press. And you might press a button like shift and all of a sudden things stop being common letters, right? With a one here. And this fifth bit would flip to a zero and the computer would start reading that as capital letters. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Any questions? Okay, so that's the point, right? ASCII is just this code that enables us to, and the different codes to do different things, right? Different codes to write Chinese characters, right? Russian characters, characters that we don't normally have. And there's a different code you can set up for a numeric keypad, keypad versus a, a full-fledged keyboard or for a calculator, right? And not all codes are the same. Right? And they got different benefits and disadvantages. So now another code is BCD, binary coded decimal. BCD is, is binary for the most part, but it tries to be more closely related to the decimal number system. So let's say we're counting one to 50. In binary, we would do that 0, 1, 2, 3, all the way up to 15, right? Where 15 would be 1, 1, 1, 1, and 0 would be 0, 0, 0, 0, right? We just count in binary. We go here, we flip, right? We come back here, and you notice that this bit flips, this bit flips, continues flipping, and this one flips every 2, and this one flips every 4, and this one flips every 8, right? Same binary. Same binary we've been working with all the time. Now, binary coded decimal, it groups the binary number based on a digit. So if the number is zero, it'll, it'll be binary for zero. If the number is two, it'll be binary for two. If the number is nine, it'll be binary for nine, right? Everything there is the same. But it groups it based on a digit. So for a number like 10, Instead of writing the binary number for 10, what we do is write binary for zero 
and then write binary for one, right? So now it's in groups of fours. Then as we go further along the chain, a number like 14, we would write binary for four and then write binary for one. A number like 15, we'd write binary for five and then write binary for one. A number like 275, we'd write binary for five then write binary for seven and then write binary for two, right? Of course, in four bits, right? Using zeros to fill in the placeholders, right? So this allows us to easily convert back to decimal numbers, right? Because when we see a number like this, right? We don't want to go saying, okay, one times two to the power of zero, then zero times two to the power of one, then one times two to the power of two, and so on and so forth, right? We can just look at this and say, okay, these first four bits, this is the number five. The second four bits, this is the number one, right? Same way here, right? First four bits, number five, second four bits, number seven, third four bits, number two, and easily convert them into. Another way this is very useful is when doing seven segment displays, right? So let's say we wanted to write down the number again, 275. We know all three numbers can't fit on a seven segment display. And if we were to convert this to a string of binary numbers, right, it would be some complicated number. And then we would have to figure out, okay, you know, is there a five in here? And we had like a bunch of numbers. There'd be a lot of logic that would go into just breaking this number up and displaying it on our three discrete seven segment displays, right? Like this, seven segment displays, the ones with the light. However, if we just stored this, right? If we just stored this as a BCD number, right? We can do zero, one, zero, one. We can do seven, which is zero, one, 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 and two, which is zero, zero, one, zero, right? And then we can send each four bits, each of the four bits into a chip, right? Into some sort of chip, and the chip would decide, hey, this number just lights it up as a five, right? But this number just like it up as a seven, but this number just like it up as a two. And we can have discrete seven segment displays just lighting up them. Okay, instead of having to go through a really large number and figure out, okay, is this a two digit binary? It is a two digit decimal number from a string of ones and zeros. Cause looking at a number like this, right? You couldn't really tell if this is a two digit number, three digit number. You couldn't tell right away. There's no easy way to tell when a number goes from a two digit to a three digit with binary. And to design a circuit in a way that it's easy to display those numbers back on seven segment displays, right? So using BCD actually really helps you out here. Right? And for all intents and purposes, they're just chips that are pre built, designed already to convert BCD. So take, for example, this dip switch here. Let me see if I get a better picture of a dip switch. So this is a dip switch. It's just four switches that you can dip them, right? You can flick them on and off, high low essentially open and close, right? And you can use that. And so this is a simple digital circuit. You can turn some on, turn some off, right? The number displayed here is one, zero, zero, right? This one's off, this one's off, this one's one. So that's eight, right? And you send that signal on. You see the LEDs indicating here that this one here is high and the rest are low. And you can send that into this BCD chip. And then it would automatically convert that 
to the seven segment display, right? And tell, tell the seven segment display, okay, light up this one. This is the number eight, right? Pretty simple, as opposed to having large numbers, right? You can just have a few of these circuits discrete. You can have another one of these circuits, drive any other seven segment display, and have the first digit come in here, the second digit come in the next one, and third digit come in the other one. Okay. Everyone following so far? Yes, sir. Okay, now gray code. Gray code, again, all these codes got the different advantages, drawbacks are useful for different things, right? As we started designing systems, we just figured, hey, you know, a code could probably do this better and have this certain advantage, right? So gray code, it's like binary, but it's designed really for a mechanical system. If you look at gray code in itself, there's no direct application that you can pull out right away. It's only when you see it being applied, then, then it starts to look useful. So gray code is an unweighted code. So you know how binary this here would have a value of whatever that value is, zero or one times two to the power of zero on this here with a half a value of two to the power of one. It's weighted, same way with the decimal number system, et cetera. This here is unweighted, which means it doesn't really have a specific value for each column, right? It looks like binary, but it's, it's not binary, right? What it is, is binary, but only one bit changes from next. So for example, gray code for zero is zero, zero, zero. Gray code for one is zero, zero, one. From zero to one, only one bit change, right? The zero changed to a one. Now from one to two, you notice in binary is zero, zero, one, zero. And in gray code is zero, one, one, right? So here, the bit that change is this zero, right? Gray code, the rule is we only change one bit, right? We only change one bit. Now going back to three, the only bit that changed is this one here, right? This one turns back into this zero. Again, only one bit change, moving from two to one. So for two here, we skip this, and remember, we only wanted one bit to change, so we changed here. And then for three, we was like, okay, we can only change one bit. Maybe we can change this one and use the number we skipped here. So it was designed with that in mind, where only one bit can change. And is used in systems where an error can occur if more than one bit changes, right? An example of a system like that would be this one a shaft encoder, right? So look at this system here on the left, right? So we got IR detectors, infrared emitter and receivers, right? So it would send an IR signal down, it would reflect onto this and come back up, right? If it's a, a reflective surface, like what here is depicted as white, it would send a signal back up, if it's black, like a non-reflective or an absorbing or passing through surface, it would not reflect the signal. So that would be represented as zero. So in this panel here, this would be one, zero, one. Right? Now let's say this disk was spinning, right? And we use the IR detector to tell whether the disk is at here or if it rotated around and it's at here, right? The position of this disc, right? Some sort of spinning shaft. Maybe you got like winch or something, right? With a bunch of rope on it. And you, you're using this to tell how much rope has been rolled down, right? This is an automated mechanical system. So as you unreal the rope, or the wire or whatever, 
the length would be something times circumference, right? Times um, you know, the circumference of the circle. And you program it up and you say, okay, one revolution, two revolutions, three revolutions, and different half revolutions. And you can meter how much rope wire cable has been left down in this automated mechanical system, right? So maybe that's what you're trying to do. Or maybe you just want to know what position is this thing in, right? Now, let's say you ended up on a line here. And there's a little bit of error, right? So one of the IR detectors reads here, one of the IR detector reads here, and one of the IR detector reads here, right? Let me change the color so you guys can see. All right, so we ended up on this line, one IR detector reading here, one reading here, one reading here, right? What it would read this number is instead of 110, or 111, it would read this number here as 111, telling it it's on here, right? Let's try a different one. Right? Let's try this line here. IR detector lands one here, one here, and one here, right? So instead of reading this number as 001, let me zoom in there a little bit. Instead of reading this number as 001 or 010, it would read this number as one, remember the white is one, right? One, zero, right? One, one, zero. Now let's look at where one, one, zero is. One, one, zero. is all the way over here. So now, instead of having an error being, hey, maybe it's on this side or maybe it's on this side, and getting one of these as the value, we get a value that's on the complete opposite side, right? Which is totally wrong, right? Which is not what we want, right? At least if one of the bits change, right? Like in this case, right? You see this one connects to this one, this one connects to this one. Right, so it doesn't matter if it measures here, it measures here, or it measures here, it measures here, right? It's only going to be it's the only false reading that it could be is the next one, or this one before, right? When only one bit changes, but when multiple bit changes, you might end up in a situation where you get an answer, a reading that's on the complete opposite side, right? So gray code tries to eliminate that. So for example, again, right, in this shaft here, right, whether it reads there or there or there or there, or here or here, right, the answer is either gonna be one zero zero or it's gonna be zero 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 because these here are all the same, right? And whether or not it's this one or that one is gonna read a code on here or a code on here. So the error is not somewhere on the other side because only one bit is changed, right? Same thing here, right? Whether it reads here or here, it's gonna give you the same value, right? Both of them is here. Whether it reads here or here, it's gonna get you the same value, right? Whether it reads here or here, it's gonna give you a value that's either this one or this one, right? So the error is now gonna jump you somewhere across to this. Is everyone following? Does that make sense? Why we'd wanna use gray code? So as you can see, these codes all got different applications. And maybe you might want to use one, you might not want to use it, right? So codes just help us do this. Now, in addition to encoding and decoding data, we also need methods to ensure the integrity of our data. That's where these two methods come in, right? The two methods I'm talking about is the parity method and the cyclic redundancy check. Now the parity method is a method for error detection. So let's say we got system one here, and we got system two here. 
and they're sending data, right? Strings are ones and zero. System one sends it to system two. Let's say it's trying to send a number one, one, one. Just try and send. Let's say somewhere along the way, there was some noise, loss of power, something happened, some glitch. And one of these ones turned into a zero. Something went wrong along the way. How does system two know that this data is the correct data, right? Or maybe this data was intercepted somewhere along the way, right? Something went wrong with it, another system imposed noise on it, or maybe it might be a malicious attack, right? In more complicated networking systems, right? Where the data was modified before it's sent. How does it know that, hey, this data is real, this data is true? Nothing happened to this data. Well, it can use something like the parity check, right? To say whether or not an error has been detected. How the parity method work? It just involves adding one bit. So the same way we would add a sign bit, right? We can add a parity bit for a string of data, right? So we'd have long strings of data. And at the end, we'd have add a parity bit which helps the system to determine if something went wrong, right? It's this extra bit, bit that we attach to the group of ones and zeros, right? And it can be an either even or odd parity, okay? So let's do the example and maybe that'll help pull things together. Let's say we have the ASCII character A, right? So we go back to this table, right? A, the letter A in ASCII is represented as this, as this binary number, right? We wanted A to be sent over using odd parity, right? Odd parity. Now, the way odd parity works is we count the number of ones, one, two, three, and we say, hey, is this an odd number or is this an even number of ones? If it's an odd number of ones, then we'll add the parity bit, right? Remember, it's an extra bit that we add in, right? An extra one bit. We'll add that as a zero. And what that does is it keeps the number of ones in the system as odd, right? Because we're using odd parity. If there was an even number of ones, right? Let's say we had four ones, we would add this as a one changing the number of ones to five, keeping the number of ones as an odd number, right? Having odd parity. So let's say, you know, this is the system, right? And we add the parity bit here in red. Let me erase everything. We add the parity bit here in one, here in red, right? It's just a zero and the data was transmitted. And for some reason, this zero here was changed to a one, right? So the system on the other side, remember system one, send in data, system two, send in data. System two is gonna collect all the data and say, all right, good. Got his data, the parity bit is a zero, right? Let's just start counting, right? You're gonna count one, one, two ones, three ones, four ones, right? Just four ones in the system, right? So we got four ones. The system we're using is odd parity. It's gonna be like, hey, is four an odd number? It'll be no, four is not an odd number. Four is an even number. Therefore, something went wrong with this data. It's able to pick up that the zero was changed to one, very simply, by just seeing here, all the ones, do they add up to an even number, right? Or an odd number, right? Again, with a zero, let's say one of the ones was changed to zero. Again, sent over to system two, it's our counting. How many ones? One, one, two ones, two ones, right? It's two ones. Is two an even number or an odd number? Like, 
two is an even number. We're using odd parity. Therefore, something must have went wrong in here, right? One of these bits must have changed. And also, even if the parity bit changed, right? The zero changed to one, right? It would be like one, two, three, four. And again, four is an even number. That would tell the system, hey, one of these bits changed. I don't know if it's the parity bit or if it's any of these bits, but one of them changed. Does that make sense? How this method is able to detect the error? It's an error detection method. It's a very simple method. There are a few drawbacks to it, right? That we will get into a bit later, but simple error detection method that you can use. Send data over and you know, the system can say, hey, something's wrong with this data. You might have system one here sending data. System two saying, hey, that data is wrong. And system two asking, hey, system one, can you resend that data? What I got looks like the wrong data. Something went wrong along the way. And you can have it resend the data, right? Make sense? Any questions? Okay, now the cyclic redundancy tech, check is an error detection method. It's a little bit more robust, a little bit more maths behind it, right? Not as simple as the parity method. It requires having the data, so we'd have the data, right? Which is a string of ones and zeros. And we would append to it as another group of bits, right? Call a checksum. Right, call a checksum. And we would send all this over. And again, it would use that data and that checksum to decide whether or not the data has been changed or modified along the way. Very similar to the parity method, right? We count the number of ones on the other side and we say, hey, you know, something went wrong. One of these bits were flipped or so something isn't right. Same thing, right? The cyclic redundancy check generate some checksum, appends it to the data, sends it across. And then on the other side, they check it. They use the checksum to check it. Right? That's why it's called a checksum. And say, hey, okay, this data is solid, no changes, right? Like the parity method, the number of ones is even or the number of ones is odd. We use an odd parity, this data is good. They look at the checksum and say, hey, you know, something went wrong with this data, request it again or hey, this data is okay, all right? Now, you, you don't need to get into all the details of the checksum. Maybe if you wanna do it as homework, that's perfectly fine, right? But just think of it as this, right? The cyclic redundancy check just appends this checksum to the data, right? And sends it over and uses that to detect whether something went wrong, okay? Good. Any questions before I move on to chapter three? No questions? Okay. So chapter three, it's super easy. So I'm not gonna go through the entire thing. And some of the stuff I already went through in the first class we had. For example, the inverter or the not gate, right? Remember we spoke about this before and we say if we put a one into the not gate, right, as the input, the output is gonna be low, right? We put in a one, we'll get out a zero. We put in a zero, we'll get out a one. So I th trust you to be able to read through this and understand. Also, for Boolean algebra, did you guys do any Boolean algebra in your maths classes yet? No, sir. No Boolean algebra. Okay. So we'll go over the Boolean algebra stuff uh, when we come to that. I think it's chapter four. All right. So again, the not gate, the and gate. Right. And you can read through this.
the OR gate is one we went through already. Okay. And this actually shows you a simple way to implement the caps lock feature I was talking about earlier when we were looking at ASCII, right? So let's say we had some ASCII number coming in. If we were to OR it, so the OR gate, let me explain the OR gate again first. The OR gate is either one of these inputs, has two inputs, right, A and B. If either one of them is high, the output's gonna be high. So if you wanted to do something like caps lock, let's say for lowercase letters, we know the fifth bit position is one. And for uppercase letters, the fifth bit position is zero, right? So what we do is we would OR it with this particular mask, right? So you would take your ASCII number, And if it was a common, if it was um, a capital letter, right? And then you OR it with this mask, it would simply just turn that fifth bit into a one, or not fifth bit, that sixth bit into a one. And that would change it from a capital letter to a common letter. And you can devise a mask that's the other way to convert from common letters to capital letters, right? If you think of it, right? Just let me just go back up to the gate, right? We got two inputs coming in. If one of them you said, hey, this one is always going to be a one, right? And then this bit coming in here, this fifth bit from your ASCII table comes in as a zero comes in as a zero, well then it's an OR gate, right? So if that bit comes in as a zero, it's gonna be OR with one and the output is gonna be a one. So you're gonna turn that bit as a zero into a one by simply ORing it with a one, right? And if you notice, the bits you OR with a zero, so like this zero here, or with a zero turns into a zero. And this one here, or with a zero, turns into a one. Well, stays a one. It doesn't turn into a zero, right? The one stays a one, the zero stays a zero. But if you or it with a one, it turns into a one. So if you or that entire ASCII number with this, With this, right, it's gonna find that bit and it's gonna make sure that bit's a one and it's gonna leave all the others as whatever they were before, right? Because again, the zeros doesn't really affect it. So again, when you start think of the shift key or caps lock key, right? It's really just activating an OR gate, ORing that data with a with a mask, right? So I trust you guys to go through and understand the different AND gates, different logic gates, the OR. I'll go through some of the more complicated ones. For example, the NAND gate. So the NAND gate is just like an like a AND gate, but you can think of it as an AND gate with a NOT gate combined, right? The N stands for not, NAND gate is just simply saying not AND, right? NAND gate, not AND. So that's just taking an AND gate, the same way an AND gate will work, right? Remember for an AND gate, an AND gate is gonna be like two input zero, zero, that's gonna be zero, one, zero, that's gonna be zero, zero, one, that's gonna be zero, one, one. 
that's going to be one, right? For an AND gate, both the inputs need to be high. Input A and input B needs to be high in order for the output to be high. Both of them need to be high. And AND gate simply takes this and sends it through a NOT gate, right? The inverter, which if the output is zero, that's going to turn into one, right? And this one here, right, zero, right? Which is what we have here, right? That's all the NAND gate is. It's an AND gate sent through a NOT gate, NAND gate. And we write it, the symbol for it is this symbol here, right? Just an AND gate, the same way we draw an AND gate with this little circle there, right? Okay. Okay. And you can use multi-sim to simulate that. We'll look at that next week when we work on the lab. And NOR gate, again, is NOR is just not OR. So it's taking the OR gate, right? The OR gate, which is like this, two inputs, excuse me, drawing. Two inputs. Yeah. It's an OR gate. Two inputs. Right? You take the output of that and you send it through an inverter, right? The NOT gate. And the output there, that's what a NOT gate is. Right? So an OR gate is zero, zero, right? Both of them are zero, would give you zero. One zero, that would give you a one because either A input A or input B can be one to give you a one. So zero one, right? Input B is a one, that's going to output as one. One one, input A and B are both one. So either or is a one, the output is going to be one. And then you take this, you send it through a not gate. So there's zero turned into a one, this one turned into a zero, this one turned into a zero, this one turned into a zero. And this here and outputs to your NOR gate. Right. And if you notice in all the slides summarized in this little cheat table that we call a truth table, which helps us map out, you know, what the system does. So a NOR gate simply does this, right? If the inputs are this. This is what it, ma it maps out. This table helps to summarize, right? Summarize the inputs and the outputs, right? And we call that table a true table. Just the word you use. Okay. okay. The X OR gate, it's like an OR gate. Right, so like an OR gate, if both are zero, it's gonna be zero, right? We need one of them to be on, to be high, right? So this here is gonna be zero. This here is gonna be one. This here is gonna be one, right? But the XOR gate stands for exclusive OR, which means exclusively, it needs to be one, right? When it's both, it's gonna be zero. Right, so just like the OR gate, whose true table is zero, one, 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 this zero, this uh, one here, this last one, which is both A and B on, both A and B high, is actually a zero, right? That's the difference between the XOR gate and the OR gate. Okay, it's exclusively that. And the XNOR gate is the XOR gate sent through a NOT gate. So we know the XOR gate true table is zero, zero, one, one, zero. The XNOR gate is the XOR gate sent through an, a NOT gate, which is one, zero, zero, one, right? Again, zero, one, one, zero, one, one, zero. 
1001, right? Just send that through a NOT gate and you get the X NOR gate. Okay. Any questions so far? I know I run through the gates, but you guys think that you can go home, read this, and learn how that works, how all the different gates work? Yes? No? Maybe? Yes, sir. Okay. Maybe, sir. Maybe. Sorry. For me personally, I can go through it. And if any question, I can ask next class. Yep. I know there should be a question here that a lot of people usually ask, which is this one, right? On this NOR gate. So if you want to know why that one's high, I can explain it in the next class. Okay. Now let's, we learn learning all this stuff. You guys are probably like, okay, when can I actually build something, right? How do I actually build a digital system? Let's look at this system. This system here is a simple combination lock, right? A simple combination lock. You can think of it as having two dip switch, two sets of dip switches, right? Remember dip switches is this. You flick them on and off, right? And this is a simple combination lock. We got dip switch one here and dip switch two here. And in these, we can use this one to encode a particular code, right? So let's say we build out something, we 3D printed, we put the chips in and we had a dip switch here and you put some sort of secret code that was hidden away here, right? Something like, uh, I'll try annotating, something like, one zero one zero right and then this one was visible it was outside the box right of, of visible available to users and they can use it and they can come and they can flip the different switches right on and off And they can enter a particular code. They can enter one, 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 right? They can flip all the switches closed and they can enter a particular code. And then that would send into this group of what kind of gates? XOR gates. So let's let's look at what this true table is for the XOR gate. Okay. So the true table for the XOR gates. So the true table for the XOR gates here, we see that when both are zero, the output is zero. And when both are ones, the output is one, is on zero. And when they're different, the output is one. So this XOR gate actually works kind of like a comparator, right? It's It outputs zero when a and B are equal, right? When A and B is zero, it's output zero. When A and B is one, it's still output zero, right? When A and B are equal, it outputs zero. The X nor gate, also a comparator, right? But when A and B are equal, it outputs one, right? When A and B are equal here, one, one, it outputs one. When A and B is zero, zero, it still outputs one. When it's different, it outputs zero, right? So the X nor gate outputs a zero, when both the inputs are the same, right? The X or, not the X more. So a zero when both the inputs are the same. So you come back to a combination lock. So the X or gate compares code, your code, so one, zero, one, zero, versus one, 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 one. And it's gonna compare, right? One to one. Are these the same? Yes, output zero. Boom, right? One, zero, are these the same? No, right? This is zero, this is one, output one, right? Are these the same? Yes, output zero, are these the same? No, output one, right? 
And then we, this here is going to be outputted here onto this line. So this line is going to automatically be one. Right? The moment any one of these are different, this line is going to be charged high, right? It's going to have that five volts, right? It's going to be one. Now, this here is a NOR gate. Right, but with both the inputs combined, right? With both the inputs combined. So both the inputs would obviously be the same. If here was low, then this would be a NOR gate with zero, zero. If here was one, then this would be a NOR gate with one, one as the input. Let's go back to the truth table and see how that would work out, right? Okay, so a NOR gate, right? So a NOR gate, remember both the inputs are gonna be zero, right? Or both the inputs are gonna be one because we tied the two ends together, right? So this one turns into a zero. This zero, sorry, this one turns into a zero. And this zero turns into a one, right? This NOR gate turns out when we tie the two inputs together, when we come here and we tie this up to this, and we say, hey, we're gonna feed you with the same signal. We're gonna feed you the zero or one, right? So you could only be the one, one or zero, zero, right? Turns out it operates like an inverter, right? It operates like a NOT gate. Let me go that over one more time, right? The inputs are tied. So whatever is A is also B. They're tied up, they're connected to each other. So it could either be zero or one. It could either be zero or one. When it's zero, that gets changed to a one. When it's one, that gets changed to a zero. So this operates like a not gate. Going back. So we compare the data. We compare their data, right? One, zero, one, zero, one, 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 one. The data was wrong. So here was automatically charged as one. This here, we figured out that this here is actually a not gate using some fancy techniques. So the output on this end is going to be a zero, right? It's going to be a zero. Here is going to be a one, right? Because remember this entire line is gonna be charged with one. Because when this one is one, it doesn't matter, right? If all the rest is zero, this entire line here is gonna be charged as one, right? So you're gonna have one going into this gate here. Then when you remember, this is a system, right? You enter in your hidden code and someone trying to ask, access the system, flips the dip switches, enters in their code, and then you press the enter button, right? to check, press this enter button and say check. Is my code good? And then this is gonna power this line, right? It's gonna power this line, and then it's gonna input one here, right? One here. So now we end up with one, one, and zero, and one here. So zero and one. Now let's see which one of these lights up. Right. So what we have here is two NOR gates again. Let's look at the NOR gate. Want to erase all this. Let's look at the NOR gate. Remember the NOR gate is an OR gate, just with a NOT symbol. So whenever anything has one, it's gonna output zero, right? Whenever anything has one, it's gonna output zero. Okay? And when anything has zero, zero, then it's gonna output one. So let's go back to our code here. And 
Uh, edit. All right. So for this line, remember here comes as one. So it's going to here is going to be one. And this line here should be one as well. It's going to output zero and not light up this go sign. So the go in order to be green, it's just not gonna light up as long as this is one. And sorry, I have this symbol here. This here, when you press this switch, this actually goes to zero, sorry. So this here is one. Whenever anything is one, it's gonna output zero here, and it's not gonna light up this go symbol. This here is gonna be zero, and this here was one on this end. This here turns into zero. So zero and zero here is gonna output a one, and it's gonna light up this system here, right? So this light is gonna be lit, and this light is gonna be off. But if you put the right code here, right? Well, we have our hidden code here, and we put the right code here, all of these are gonna output zero. So therefore this line is gonna be zero. Here is gonna be zero. And this here is gonna be flipped to a one, right? Remember this is a NOR gate. This is a one Out output here is gonna be zero. So this light here is gonna be off. Remember we're pressing enter here. We're gonna put a zero here and a zero here, right? Remember this voltage here is powering here all the time, right? Is gonna be charging it with one. When we press this switch, it's gonna take the path of least resistance and electricity is gonna go to ground. So what here is gonna be seeing is zero volts. Electricity is not, no longer gonna be flowing here, it's gonna go to ground. There's gonna be zero and there's gonna be zero. This here was zero, flip to one, so this here is not gonna light up, right? Nor gate. This here is zero, so the input here is gonna be zero. And with the nor gates, when both input is zero, this here is gonna light up, right? And it's gonna set go, right? Of course, you can have this power a relay or some sort of electronic lock, some solenoid that opens and unlocks something or turns on a light. Or maybe you want a passcode to turn on a fan. Of course, it'd have to be some sort of isolation, right? These circuits are very small, low voltage, five volts. So you'd have to have something here. Maybe you can use this light and have some sort of up, up to cupola, sense that light, and then energizes your other circuit, right? Use this light, use this signal here to turn on something else, right? And drive a relay that turns on a, a larger system. Does that make sense? Does this whole process here make sense? Are we... Uh, how we would design this simple combination lock. Any questions on how it works? No questions? So let's say in a test, ask you guys, you know, design a simple combination lock. You think you'd be able to design one? So it depends upon how complex you want us to do it. If I say, you know, that takes six input bits, could you design one that takes six input bits? How would you modify this one, like six input bits? Right, so this one here currently has four input bits, right? How would you modify it to take six input bits? So um, from the design of this circuit here, all we need to do is just add a few more add two more um, gates to the input and mm -hmm. uh, along with your respective um, diode and full lung resistors and then you have you got it obviously upgraded dip switches to six mm -hmm. um six input along with your pull up um you pull lung resistors mm -hmm. and uh yeah that's about it nothing much other than that good and it should exactly. it should work just the same yeah. exactly good so it makes sense I'll send you guys this picture if I remember, okay? So at least from this class, you start to put 
put things together, right? I know so far we've been learning about binary numbers, right? And, and and gates and or gates, but I like to do simple applications like this. So you can see it all come together, right? You know, I know you guys have used resistors before transistors, but not really have logic gates in a circuit like this, right? With voltage being applied. So this is a good, easy, practical example. Okay, so that's all for chapter three, I hope. No, actually, there's some more stuff. Okay. All right, let me just run through this stuff and then we'll call it class, okay? So a lot of this stuff we've covered before. Remember I said previously, they're fixed function logic devices. So you can always go and collect a chip that you would have you know, some AND gates wired up inside and they would be, of course, wired up to particular pins. And different families, different technologies, right? Different packages, the BIP package and the SOIC package and the transistor technology that it uses, right? This is transistor to transistor logic, PTL, right? CMOS, complementary metal oxide semiconductor. By CMOS uses this transistor to transistor logic as well as CMOS, right? It's just the type of transistors, how they hook up the configuration, which is something you learn a little bit about later on, right? And they can come in some common configurations, right? Maybe you want a chip. Let's say you, you settled your mind design. Okay, I want to build this combination lock from class. Then you would go out, you'd find a chip that has four XOR gates like this, right? And then you can use that in your circuit and build, like, wire it up, of course, and build that particular, particular circuit, right? Build that particular system, okay? And of course, these chips have certain operating parameters, right? Like any other chip, right? They got a certain supply voltage that you need, right? Current parameters, right? Power that it uses, you know, storage temperature. You know, thing with electronics, you can't let them get too hot or they might not operate as expected, right? As temperature goes up, resistance is gonna vary, things like that, right? Sometimes certain chip, if you get too hot, it might burn and it might not work, it might go bad, and things like that. If you apply the wrong voltages to it, you might fry the chip, things like that, right? So they usually come with a sheet that has the different values associated with it, right? And then they're programmable logic devices, which from your essay you may have read about, right? And they would have logic gates already built inside of them, right? So it would have like an AND gate already built. And you would energize different cells. Let's say we turn this one on and we left the rest to zero. These are red. Shows better. Turn this one on and left the rest to zero. And we also turn this one on. Then that in, of course, this is a, a large chip with a lot of different transistors inside and a lot of different gates. Right, it would start connecting up wires, right? It would connect up this A. This transistor here is energized, which would create this path onto this line. And that would go, and it would go into this input of the AND gate, right? And nothing wouldn't come from here, right? Because this here is off, this here is off, this here is off, right? And this one would go, right? This one here is on, so it would create the path into the AND gate, right? So we end up ANDing this line with this line, okay? And these here, let me show you guys what these look like. So same way like you would program an Arduino or something. It's like a board with a chip, it's kind of like, more processor based than like an IC. It's like these flat, you know, more complicated chips that you can plug up 
right? And you can plug into a computer. And on your computer, you would actually type code. And I'm sure since you guys used MATLAB, right? You, you know what code looks like. You can figure out what this code means, right? This code is simply just writing a NAND gate. Okay, so we say NAND gate, we want A and B to be the input. And the output is gonna go something called LED, right? You know, um, how we would label variables in MATLAB, like my num, my number, or, you know, average temperature, however you, you wanna do MATLAB. However, you want to label the variable. Same thing, right? You can label different gates. You can call it NAND gate. You can call it my NAND gate. You can call the variables A, B, C, X, Y, Z. You can call them LED. You can make different inputs, different outputs. And then you can tell the system how it behaves, right? Right. So for something simple like a NAND gate, you might say, okay, a NAND gate is simply just NANDing A and B, right? And that uh, goes to the output variable LED that we label that, right? And that's the gate behavior. But you can do something more complicated, right? You can do A or it would be, and then and that with C and so on and so forth, and then develop more complicated logic, right? It doesn't have to be simple like this, right? So you would get these programmable logic devices outcome different chips like this the different ones from different companies and you would write code and code like this different you know different programming languages right there's bhdl which is a hardware description language and there's very lot right the same way we'd have python to program computers and we'd have Mac lab to do math. And then we'd have C and C++ and C sharp, right? All these different programming language. We got BHDL and Verilog, right? Different chip manufacturers might use different programming languages, right? And then that's how you would type code and load it up onto the chip and tell it, this is how I would like you to behave. And the chip just operates that way, right? Okay. So I'll send out chapter four by email. And next week, we're going to do two classes. One class we're going to teach. And another class we're going to do the lab and work through the binary worksheet. Okay. So that's all I have for you guys today. Any questions before I close off? Okay. No questions? All right. Enjoy the rest of your night, guys. Stay safe. You too, sir. Thanks. Bye. All right, sir.